Hello everyone, how's your week been? If you're based in London, have you basked in the glorious sunshine? What else is going on? Have you recorded a voicemail yet for our listeners' episode? Simon from Seoul Foreign School has. All you do is go to speakpipe.com forward slash the EdTech podcast and say who you are, what you do and a birthday wish for the EdTech podcast turning one. In our house, our Japanese camper van and our boiler have both broken down and we are currently working out how to get a two-year-old, a tent and a tandem down to the south coast, which is a bit like one of those logic mind teasers where you have to get a goat across the river in a boat, or at least that's how I remember it. I also achieved a life goal this week by finally cycling around the Olympic velodrome, which was amazing and terrifying. If you're looking to be inspired in the education world, I'd recommend you check out Jazz and Poor Far's TEDx talk about why we are all heroes. It's pretty mind-blowing stuff and reminds us all why we all make a difference, even when we least know it. In other news this week, a big shout out to this week's sponsors, Glissa EDU. This is an easy one for me as I regularly use Glissa at events because I frankly find it a bit weird when there are people staring at you, but you ignore them. Glissa is an audience engagement platform and they also have an education offer for socialising lectures where they take regular PowerPoint or keynote presentations and push each slide out live to students' mobile devices as they are presented. Professors, administrators and students get valuable data on where information is really engaging or needs reworking and staff and students can interact through the deck. You can check them out at glissa.com forward slash student dash engagement. Next up, a word from Class Central, which if you're into geeking out over online learning and MOOC reports like I am, you'll probably already know about. Unless you've been asleep during the last 10 plus years, MOOCs or massive online open courses are changing the way we experience higher and further education and workplace learning. With significant online courses available, gaining insight into this fast-paced world is worth spending time on, especially for those implicated by such changes. That's where Class Central comes in. Not only does it list hundreds of courses, and importantly including non-profit courses as well as the big Ivy League unis, but the MOOC report blog has some excellent analysis on what's up, down, new or just slightly left field. I came across Class Central when I was preparing for a Department for International Trade webinar and found it invaluable. Since then, I've met the founder out at South by Southwest EDU and he was excited to share the resource with all of you. So definitely go and check it out at www.class-central.com forward slash report and let me know what you think. One final shout out this week via previous guest Hannah Wilson and that is that on Friday the 30th of June the GLF Academy in the UK will be holding its GLF School Showcase for 23 schools across the UK. The day will be held at Glynn School and the event will be opened by the National Schools Commissioner Sir David Carter. There's an opportunity for exhibition and for external organisations or individuals to put forward speaking proposals and these must be submitted by Tuesday the 18th of April. Details are in the show notes and a great opportunity to be involved. Right, after that mammoth intro, let's get on to this week's show. It's the last of our 2017 Bet EdTech Trend series and this week we're looking at gaming, apps, coding, AR and audio, thinking about artificial reality and mobile apps to engage learners in biology, the development of coding for computational thinking and why listening helps to enhance learning. Obviously a big tick for that last one for me there. I hope you enjoy and do keep the feedback coming. Have a great week and whatever the weather's like outside, enjoy the sunshine. Bye-bye. I'm here with Raul Gutierrez, CEO and founder of TinyBot. And Raul, it's it's right at the end of the day, isn't it? It is the end of the day. We have survived. (laughs) You look incredibly relaxed. I'm a pretty relaxed guy. I've worked uh, always at the intersection of uh, entertainment and art, usually. Um, education was something I came to through my kids but uh, before Tiny Bop I had worked at another startup that sold art uh, and before that I had worked in the film business so I used to work at Paramount Pictures and, very interesting. and uh, but I was a teenage programmer so that's that's my, my the sh- very short version of a very long story <laughs> 
And and did you continue that programming, and or is that just the kind of kernel? It's always at the been part of the background. Like I actually was never a good enough programmer to officially call myself a programmer. Yes. I was also never a good enough designer to call myself a designer, but I was good enough at both to recognize who was really great. And I think uh, part of my role is to pick really great people and to work with those great people. So in terms of Tiny Bot then and the team you've got there, what, what's the kind of main educational problem that you solve and how would you describe Tiny Bot to someone that's listening to this? So... TinyBop is a company that we sell apps in series, and they're STEM apps particularly. And it started really out of my frustration. I have, I have two little boys, and the iPad was their favorite toy. Um, my oldest son, when he was about to have his sixth grade birthday, he asked me if he could trade his birthday party for uh, an iPhone. And... It was a big moment for me because I, as a parent, had kind of a contentious relationship with screens in general. We're Luddites. I have a lot of books in the house. Um, And it frustrated me that that for him this was what he called an everything machine. It could be a toy. It could be a storytelling device. It could be a tool. Um, And at that moment, my programming side of me wanted to understand why. And I also wanted to understand why I was so frustrated with it. And so for several months, I played with my son with every single thing that he touched on the iPad and iPhone. Um, And what I realized is that many of the things that he loved about the the iPad were things that were created for adults. Mm -hmm. So he liked making stop motion videos and he liked uh, uh, playing with a camera. But many of the educational games, we couldn't keep him in. And many of those games were things that had been built on traditional gaming mechanisms or sometimes even gambling mechanisms where uh, it's reward-based. You win. It's like Pavlovian. Like you click and you win a bunch of points and, you know, there's hearts. And it sort of wore off and I wasn't sure that he was actually learning anything. Um, That's that's very interesting that you talk about that because... I mean, obviously, most of the social media that we interact with as adults is based on this, you know, lighting up part of the brain when we get the notifications and that kind of thing. And it's, like, addictive, but also makes you feel a bit dirty at the end of the day when you spend so much time on your phone. It's empty. It's very empty. And so I decided there that I wanted to create a company that did the opposite of that. Um, At the the very first thing that I wrote before I even had the company name... Uh, was designing for quiet. Um, And how do we do that? How do we encapsulate uh, the best parts of an analog childhood in a digital realm? And so we had this idea of creating series of apps that covered big subjects that kids everywhere need to know about. And we decided to start with the human body because kids start with themselves. And so we looked at every old child's book about the human body. And then we we all sort of sat and we wrote what were the things that kind of inspired us to learn about the human body when we were kids. And for me, those old encyclopedias that have the transparencies that move back and forth was was a big uh, thing that I used to just love and obsess over. And the thought was, how do we encapsulate that idea in a digital product, but then also use all the kind of magical things that are in the iPad? the camera and the uh, microphone and the accelerometer and all that. And so little by little, we uh, created this app, very much inspired by old books, um, but using these modern techniques. And right away, even as I was developing it, I could see that it was really sticky with kids. Um, And throughout the process, the idea was, how do we embed the learning in the interaction rather than some reward Mm -hmm. and how do we design without instructions without beginnings without ends that the exciting thing is the journey itself Um, and so that's really what guided us our first app that human body app came out in August of 2013 and I think initially I had hoped what we thought was very ambitious for 10,000 downloads in the first month um, and we had 8,000 downloads in the first day. 
Um, and so right away we knew that we had something. And is that paid for? They're paid downloads. Yeah. And so um, now we have 13 apps. We have millions of downloads around the world. Um, each app has launched on the homepage of the App Store. Um, several of them have been uh, Editor's Choice. One was App of the Year. Um, you know, we've been the number one educational app in 155 territories. They've been very uh, successful around the world. Um, but still, we're right now mainly being discovered by parents. Mm -hmm. So our next step in our evolution is uh, teachers are often our biggest advocates. And we're in over 600,000, we've had over 600,000 educational downloads of the app um, to educational institutions. And so now we're working to build uh, all the apps on the web and create a subscription model that works better for schools. Mm -hmm. Because the truth is, apps for the iPad or the Android, they often come into schools one by one by the teacher. And that's not how you sell to schools. Mm -hmm. And it's not how you get into schools. So um, by uh, September of this year, we hope to have all of our apps wrapped up behind uh, an interface for the web. And um, so that's our, our, our big next step. And that's why I'm guessing you're at BETS. Yeah, that's why we're here. Yes. So. And, and But you're based out of the U.S.? Yeah, we're in Brooklyn. Yeah, Brooklyn. Okay, cool. And then... Um, uh, and just to... Yeah. So one of the reasons we're here is that from the beginning, uh, localization was very important. We don't have a lot of text in the apps, but we do have labels for everything. We think that naming things is really important. And we make it very easy for kids to... When they click on a label, it falls off, and automatically they want to put it back on. Um, and we've localized those labels in uh, over 50 languages, in, in some cases up to 60 languages. So um, Abby, one of the people who's helping us uh, today, uh, she, she was uh, born in Wales, uh, was super shocked to see that we were supported Welsh in the okay, apps. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so we're here because uh, the U.S. is actually only part of our market. We sell to countries everywhere. Um, all around the world. And England is really the center of the rest of the world. Um, many of the interesting conversations we've had have been people that buy for entire countries. Mm -hmm. And so, and we fit very well uh, within that because the apps are not curricular, they're just models. They're essentially working active models. You can blow up a volcano or make an earthquake or make the eye blink or make a human body uh, go to the bathroom. And, and, um, you can use those in classes through a very wide ra age range of kids and through uh, a wide range of pedagogies as well. And aesthetically, they're very pleasing. We, so, what, what's the, we, we were inspired by yeah. old children's books. And I think yeah. a lot of the artwork on modern apps is just this side of clip art. And so we, there are a lot of great designers and illustrators in, out there, and we are choosing people that are the best of the best. And which other apps or content do you rate? So I have a two-year-old, mm -hmm. and I'm always asking this question, you know, if he is going to spend some screen time, then what's of value? And people uh, reference Toka Boka quite often. Mm -hmm. Are there any other um, sort of apps out there that you recommend? Well, Toka Boka uh, is a great example. They're corporate friends of ours. Yeah. Uh, uh, we have we share a very similar philosophy around apps and especially around gender and inclusion. Um, we're very careful in our apps. We make science apps, so we want girls to like them just as much as boys. Uh, so we test with girls and boys. We also test with a wide socioeconomic uh, group of kids. Um, and you find that very different kids with different backgrounds experience what they're seeing differently. Um, they're some kids that have never imagined a volcano, that have never imagined the insides of their body. And so, you know, how do you, uh, how do you bridge that gap? So Togo is a great example. We actually have on our website, uh, tinybob.com slash loves, um, we talk about other apps and books that we love that yeah. kind of share our philosophy of creating beautiful, deep, engaging content for children. And so we have a bunch of our friends are there. There's uh, 
there's an app that just came out uh, on Google recently called uh, Toontastic. Um, Toontastic lets kids tell their own stories, puts kids at the center. Um, I think most of the apps that we recommend on that site are things that are not buying into somebody else's narrative, but the kid's narrative is the narrative that is the, the thing that comes out. It's definitely something I've picked up on here is this, this idea of um, student-led design. So that approach to, to actually developing you know, educational resources, experience, etc., which actually thinks about how they engage with stuff. So rather than you know everything being geared towards what adults think they should learn right. and, and so on. And I think it's been going that way for a while, but it's just struck me more this time. I think it's right now, at least in the U.S., um, progressive education is in many leading schools the sort of the philosophy of the moment um my sons uh, both go to a super progressive school um that is supposed to be one of the best in brooklyn but we also saw the limits of that as well we have two very different kinds of students in my own family like a younger son is just insatiably curious academic kid who Every year we get the note from the teacher that says, you know, once in a teaching career you get a child like Gabriel. Um, he's just covered in gold stars. He is covered in gold stars and he can't help it. Yeah. And, you know, he surprises me every day with, he's right now, he's nine years old and he's reading um, uh, uh, way beyond his level. Uh, he, well, he's reading Lord of the Flies. Yeah, yeah. And so last night I called him over Skype and he said, Dad, you know, why... When kids die in Lord of the Flies, why do their bodies always go out to sea? What is that symbolic of? <laughs> it's like, oh, man. Like, <laughs> yeah. he, I've had a hard day. I've been a battle day. You know? <laughs> yeah. So my older kid is very much a kid that he needs a lot of support. Mm-hmm. He's not the kid that's going to go out there and make these beautiful connections between things. He, he needs a certain amount of rigor. He needs a certain amount of practice. And putting him at the center of everything... It's not always necessarily the, the, the best strategy for yeah. him uh, to push him to the right place. So I think there has to be a balance between our apps are open-ended and they're, they're real sandboxes, but they're also rigor, rigorously accurate and rigorously researched. And there's a certain amount of, um, I, I think sometimes the problem with progressive stuff when it goes too far is... You know, they'll say, okay, you write your story. It doesn't matter your spelling or your, you know, grammar. Just go ahead and write whatever you want. Yeah. And they never actually have a chance Do to it in, like, that. figurative dance and... I've, I, I've seen that. But it's, it is uh-huh. interesting because, you know, you live in Brooklyn, I live in East London, and someone who's from a more traditional background would be like, you know, it's so obvious, the progressives, like, thinking about where... I don't know, just in terms but of reflecting on here's, that. But here's the counter-argument, mm-hmm. is that in our office of 20 people... I don't think there's one person, except for maybe me, who has a job that really existed when I was a kid. So we have people that that they're rigging virtual puppets. That job did not exist when I was a child. So the skills a person needs to do that job are not necessarily the A, B, C's, one, two, three skills that you need. I think that the challenge of, of a modern education is to give kids enough experience with different ways of thinking and teaching them um, about science, about literature, about art, and giving them enough kind of raw material to make connections. So my nine-year-old, the student who's the, you know, advanced in everything, um, he's really into origami. And he's, he's a master origamist. He, 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 he is in a club in New York City with 50 and 60 year old people doing fractal origami that is way beyond even you know adults he's also taking a robotics class because he loves robotics what was fascinating to me was that his teacher came running to me after this robotics class and said your son just figured out the most amazing thing and he said he got the idea because of something that was happening in origami like how these folds connect together informed him on how to solve this problem with something they were trying to move with the robots. And like I think that was my proudest moment yeah, yeah. I've ever had because that, to me, is the essence of what teaching a child um, these separate things and letting them put it together in ways that are interesting. 
And that's what we try to facilitate. And that's what we try to in, 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 in gender in kids. And what, what do you think about Betsy DeVos? It, I think she's a disaster. And uh, I think, I mean, if, if we want to have another podcast, uh, okay, I, that I one think needs a whole hour, whole hour. every single person on our team, um, we have a young team, but uh, most of us were in marches, uh, either in Washington or New York. I was on that as well. And uh, I am terrified about what's going to happen over the next couple of years. Um, I think it's going to be a disaster for education, for diversity, for inclusion. And um, I think the one good thing that's come out of it is that suddenly you have a group of people that is very politically motivated that are putting their minds to trying to make a difference and trying to fight against things where maybe even six months ago we were much more passive about those things well thank you so much and and how can people follow up if they're interested to find out more uh well our website uh, tinybop.com has explanations about all our apps tinybop.com slash loves is our recommendation site we're recommending books and apps of other people not ours there's no paid endorsement we spend in our office a lot of time looking at children's media, and we like to highlight other things that are out there that are the best. Um, you can search for Tiny Bop on the App Store. Soon we'll be on Android, uh, and coming in September, uh, we'll be on the web. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Okay, fantastic. So I just uh, got chatting to uh, Alice Lacey, who is CEO of Now Press Play. And uh, you will probably have seen them about if you think about very pink headsets and pink branding. But it just got me thinking uh, we must have a shared love of audio. And, and um, it was actually, I think, this, this quote down here, that the ability to transport your mind to another place using the power of sound has increased the enjoyment and engagement in learning. So... Um, I think that's really interesting because I've, I've thought about this a lot with podcasts when people say, what about video, what about this? Yeah. So, um, We were just chatting about how you actually launched this. Was it four or five years ago now? Yeah, that's right. Um, so before I set up Now Press Play, I was a theatre director and I'd taken part in Silent Discos at the Edinburgh Festival a few, uh, few years ago. And so I had this idea for um, a new way to tell stories through these wireless headphones, this new technology that was available. I took that idea to a teacher friend of mine, Oscar, and he immediately said we should do this with children. So we wrote a story. It had no educational content in it at all. It was a story about aliens. We took it into a school just to test it out. And it was the engagement of the children that made us think we've got something here and we should we should carry on with this idea. I mean, the idea was so good, we just kind of couldn't leave it alone. And so what happened? Did you just quit your job? And, and is he still a teacher yeah. or what yeah, happened so there? He's, um, yeah, so he's, he's still... Uh, working with children he's actually moved to Lebanon now he's working with Syrian refugees out there um, but I yeah it was, it was a slow it was a gradual process um, and because we did a lot of piloting work for a long time so we were making the experiences trying them out in schools and we did everything on a shoestring for a couple of years and then finally when we had eight different audio experiences ready we, la- we launched the company and we were selling workshops to schools and we did that for a couple of years, but we realised really quickly on that we wanted this to be a, a resource that teachers could deliver because there's no reason why we had to go in and deliver it. And we knew that the impact could be huge if it could become a way that teachers taught and children learn. One question I always ask, so what educational problem do you solve? Ooh, very good question. Um, I, I would solve the problem of assessment. I think assessment is driving education in completely wrong direction. We all know that teachers teach for exams now, and that's happening earlier and earlier and earlier. So I would uh, I'd solve the problem of assessments by removing them entirely. Uh, the problem that we solve is we give teachers a way that they can deliver the curriculum through movement because we know that not everybody learns best through reading and writing and sitting still. Some children... Some adults need to think in order, uh, sorry, need to move in order to think. And we give teachers a way that they can get children moving in a way that's organized and uh, safe and that they can access the curriculum in a different way. That's very interesting. So I interviewed the CEO of the Dyslexia Association. Mm -hmm. Basically, that was what she was saying, that um, for some dyslexics, it's the movement or touch or being tactile that sort of aids that learning process. Well, out out in the real world, when you're an adult, you don't get punished for not being able to sit still, for being someone who's always moving around, but at school you do, and and it seems the wrong way around to me. 
And so um, I wonder if we can um, put the microphone in here, yeah. if that will work. We could try. Let's give it a go. So I'm just turning the headsets on now. So if I'm a student, I'm in class. Okay, so we've got a bit of Vikings coming up. Go to the centre and look around. Ah. It's very long with a tall mast and a carved dragon head at the front. See this wooden chest? Graham is pointing at a large wooden box. Everything you need is inside. So basically, um, what that immediately makes me think of is, um, what was the programme on ITV with the headset? And it was a game and the kid had to avoid obstacles and it was working with his team. I don't know. Night, night something or other. Oh. Do you remember this? I don't know, but I mean, you know, not, nothing we're doing is particularly new. You, know, you had something that, uh, called um, uh, music and movement. Um, in the hall, you know, BBC Radio, Schools Radio has been around for years and years and years doing things similar to this, i.e., you know, narration and children moving. And then actually getting kids, I mean, you've got Pokemon Go, you've got the whole yeah. thing about whether that aids, uh, you know, trying to rid our nations of Absolutely. obesity and so yeah. on. Interesting. And uh, if people want to follow up with you, how can they uh, do so? Yeah, so the best way is to go to our website, which is nowpressplay.co.uk, or you can yeah. follow us on Twitter at nowpressplay. Okay, thanks very much, Alice. Thanks Thank you. So I'm here and uh, we bumped into each other in the beer queue at the Teach Meet with Ed Barton, who's the CEO of Curiscope. And um, for anyone who may have followed the Teach Meet resolution event, you may have seen an ICT evangelist on stage giving a demo of this T-shirt. And I was in the room and there were actual gasps. And as I get older, I realise these gasps don't happen that often anymore because everyone's very cynical so that was quite cool so um ed can you tell us a little bit what curoscope is and uh how long you've been doing it as well yes um so curoscope is a company where we create vr and ar learning experiences and products to ignite interest and like change perspectives around subjects so try and bring people into something to try and give people a new perspective so for example with the virtuality we think that for a lot of kids that we've spoken to at schools biology for some reason is something they can't really get to grips with something they can't identify with and we felt there was an opportunity to contextualize learning about the body by literally looking beyond your skin and that's really like cool for kids but it's also actually a bit of a step change in how we learn because it's contextualized it's like actually seeing inside someone's body and that's the effect we wanted to get really close to so the thing that we just did a quick demo of is ar working with a t-shirt here are all of your products t-shirts or what other products do you have if they're not <laughs> yeah it's a good question a lot of people said like can we do another t-shirt can we do a hat can we do gloves people want us to do like an entire clothing range um, the reason we have done a t-shirt is purely because we think that there was a reason to do it in the context of anatomy and biology. Um, ultimately, our other projects are digitally led. Um, we do a lot of VR experiences. Um, we have a VR experience that's, I believe, the fifth most viewed VR experience of all time. Um, so that's the other kind of thing we do. But really, we're looking for anything where kids aren't necessarily connected to something, where is an opportunity to do that. The VR experience that you mentioned, what, what's that? Um, so it's diving underwater with great white sharks. So obviously everybody wants to dive underwater with great white sharks, but we saw an opportunity to do something that wasn't the kind of typical Jaws thing where a shark eats you and it's like really scary. Actually, this was an opportunity to learn about marine conservation and go eye to eye with a shark and therefore understand that environment a little bit more, connect with it and potentially introduce people to what is quite an amazing career, which is marine biology. And how did you get into all of this? Because, well, I'm definitely guilty of this, of having a bit of a baby face myself, but you, you, you don't, <laughs> um, let's put it like this, you, you haven't got a lot of grey hair, um, well, yeah. you still have that sort of youthful energy. Yeah. So how old are you, if you don't mind me um, asking? 27. Okay, so that's disgraceful. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, did you go? Um, did you go to something like Brighton, uh, Brighton or Sussex University, or did you just um, happen to be down there no, now? No, no, my my connection with Brighton is very, very recent. I only moved down there. I still haven't actually physically moved down there, although we have moved the office down there because it's an amazing place to have a company. It's an amazing place to be. Um, 
I went to university in Leeds. Um, that feels like ages ago now, but it must have only been, I don't know, five or six years ago. Um, then I worked in advertising for a bit. Um, I guess became a bit disillusioned working for brands, and actually we wanted to create something for ourselves. Um, teamed up with my now co-founder, who was an amazing animator. He's been BAFTA nominated, fantastic at his job. And we just wanted to start doing stuff for ourselves that actually added a little bit of value to the world. How do you think you differ from something like Blipper? Blipper are great, and like we're very good friends with um, the guys who work yeah. there. I think where we fit in is that Blipper really wants to be the AR platform for recognising everything. We want to, I guess, go a little bit deeper in the sense that we want people to have like full-on experiences. We don't want to just be about like recognising something and learning like a bite-sized fact. We actually want to create experiences in VR and AR that you couldn't have in real life, that you couldn't have otherwise. You want to give kids the opportunity to experiment with things in virtual reality that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise to go places you wouldn't be able to do otherwise um, and yeah so we end up I guess quite focused on virtual reality as well whereas Blipper are very much kind of focused on AR. I mean you mentioned coming out of advertising what's your own particular background um, what did you study or um, you know what was your own education like because I think yeah. what I found after doing probably about 50, 50 or more of these interviews is that Um, let's say the people that end up working with technology and innovation didn't always have that surrounding them when they grew up it's more like the the curiosity yes yeah yeah. so as you may have guessed by calling it curoscope we're quite into curiosity and curiosity driven learning I think my personal learning at school I think I was never really that into science and it really looking back on it I find that really confusing because science is incredible and kind of things like about the human body physics etc like fascinating amazing and for some reason I was never really encapsulated at school by that naturally like a lot of people who've entered startup worlds I was driven by an interest in coding and development and that was sparked by one amazing lesson that I had at school that actually got me wanting to do that every evening at home learning that for three or four years and we feel I guess why we started Curoscope is we believe we can create millions of those moments so that people have that spark that drives them to do something hopefully for the rest of their life that is unlike anything they would have ever done before. And so you're at BET I'm imagining uh, you've had lots of conversations what, what's the kind of main goal for 2017 for Curoscope? Last year was very much about kind of putting our name out there it was very much about just releasing a couple of products that we thought were really really great that hopefully we could get out to people in the right hands i think this year is really about how do we scale that how do we get that to as many people as possible we think that we've got really great products that we've built that's really well polished and a lot of people really really love teachers like come up to me like begging me for more of this product like people really really love it and i want to get to a point where we've put this in the hands of say a hundred thousand people this year i think that'd be really exciting for us and i think it's just generally quite a nice altruistic thing because i know that it's not just us selling a hundred thousand items it's actually potentially changing how that many people think about a subject so if i wanted to go online right now and buy that t-shirt and access to the software etc uh, how much would that cost yes so we so we did kickstarter campaign we we're like probably the only Kickstarter campaign that's actually shipped a product and not gone bankrupt in the process. Um, you can buy this product now on curoscope.com, which is C-U-R-I-S-C-O-P-E.com. Um, and the product is £20. And um, T-shirts come in three colours, all sizes from age four up to 2XL adult. Um, and they should ship relatively quickly, probably within a week. I should have mentioned this before. It pairs with a free app that is on Android, iOS, tablets, mobiles. And can people use the free app anyway? Um, so people can test the free app on our website. Um, the T-shirt is obviously the hook for it to really work really well. Um, but we don't do it on kind of a per license thing. Like you can get one T-shirt for a class and everyone can download the app. That's absolutely fine. Yeah, yeah. Okay, very interesting. And then how can people follow you on Twitter? I know you're on Twitter yes. there. Um, so we're at Curoscope and I am at Ed underscore Barton. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Ed. Thank you very much. 
So I'm here with uh, Mark Overland, who's Head of Education at Primo Toys. Really pleased to catch up finally and also find out a little bit more about Mark joining Primo and your own background because I know that you've, so you've been here now for four months, is that right? That's right, yeah. I've joined Primo Toys in October 2016 and four months later, still here at the round table with, uh, with you, Sophie, and it's really nice to be a part of the Tech podcast. And so Mark... Um, Canadian by birth? Yeah, Canadian by birth, and I have a kind of a weird accent as well. So I've been in a variety of different countries and a variety of different roles. My, I came from Canada in 2002 to the UK to be a maths teacher and then worked my way up into British schools. And then in 2011, made the gigantic leap to international schools. And since that time, I've been in the Middle East, so Qatar, and then went to Sri Lanka, then went to Beijing, then went back to Canada, then went back to Kuwait, and ended up in Egypt, where I was a year ago. That's amazing. And so obviously some quite huge political changes during those times as well. I mean, from your experience on the education side of things, which were your favorite experiences internationally and your least favorite? That's a, that's a really good question. And a lot of the countries that I went to had very, very good um, systems, mostly IB systems and into British international schools. They're one of the best experiences I had was actually in Sri Lanka at the British School of Colombo, where the pastoral system was probably one of the best things I've seen. And without, let's say, the normal use of technology, the young learners are much more involved in the extracurricular programs that have them compete and get out of the country into the top universities in the world. So it's a really, really interesting um, political climate mixed with a school dynamic. Interesting. And from Qatar to Beijing to Colombo, I mean, what, what was the experience of how they went about using technology? Is there sort of a various varying appetites for that? There is. There's a lot of different ways they go about using technology from 2011, where it was mostly going into a lab type environment. So the computers were there in a very traditional thing. Yeah. And they're using and logging in and things like that to Beijing, where everyone has a phone. And so you get to a one to one access point where the kids are learning about technology, but also just as quick, the teachers have to learn how to teach with technology, which is often the limiting factor. Interesting. And and so from your experience, say in Beijing, were most of those teachers, were they international teachers or were they teachers from Beijing? It was a combination, really. The schools that I was working at are, let's say, tier two schools, so not, you know, the, the top dogs. And so they hired a mixture of expat teachers and also local teachers with a variety of different skill sets. Yeah. And so how many years were you in the sort of education systems, you know, variously across uh, being a teacher and being a principal? And- so it's been about 15 years so yeah yeah, the best part of my life has been within the education system in some way in some direction leading directly from university into um, teaching full-time so what was the spur from uh, leaving Egypt and returning to the UK and you know in this new capacity as well at Primo well that's an interesting one so I returned to the UK with my family and to my wife is British and we have two kids now we have two kids at the one we only had one so we have a new daughter and it was the best decision to come back, to be with family, to enjoy that. And when I came back, I didn't particularly want to be involved in UK schools just because of the big changes that happened since 2011 and um, since then. But I wanted to still be involved in education itself. And through some um, networks of people, Primo Toys came up and it was an interesting one that they're focused on early learning, which my older daughter is at five years old. And I felt that I could have the biggest impact within education working at a private company that deals with coding for young people. And so someone with a maths background or a former maths teacher, I mean, what's your uh, perception of coding? Because at the moment there's, there's almost, the debate's almost gone full circle where people are sort of saying, well, you know, if AI comes in, is actually the the skill of learning the the minutia of coding is that going to be usurped by AI and in in perhaps the same way that maths will I mean what's your thoughts on on that argument the interesting part about coding for me is not necessarily the code within itself the interesting part is developing creativity through the use of code and the idea of creation of something and adding to a guess a pool of knowledge that isn't already there and 
you can have computers now draw, you can have computers do a whole bunch of things. And as artificial intelligence has taken that next step, they'll always be able to do that, but not with the human touch. So I think there'll always be a need for that sort of creativity there. And at Primo Toys, we're about the creativity aspect through the coding. So we teach the fundamentals of computational thinking and how that transcends throughout the curriculum so the young learners are empowered to create and they're resilient when they fail and so what's keeping you up at night from sort of the next you know looking forward to the end of 2017 what do you have on your agenda that you're both excited about and thinking right that's what the big one that I want to tackle as well this year yeah it's it's a really interesting one because we have a fantastic uh, tool, which is Kibeto, so a learning tool that helps teach coding to ages three to six through tactile pieces. And the next part of that for us as um, the education team is to develop the content. So previously when I was mentioning that teachers are often the ones that don't have the confidence, certainly teaching ages five, six, and seven computational thinking is developing content for them to use at a level they'll understand it so they have the confidence to deliver. The What we see happening, just as there potentially is a science and maths gap now for young learners, is a digital gap may be there in the future. And we want to minimize that as quickly as possible. So content is a huge aspect of what we're going to do. There's some other products coming online, which I can't talk about, but they're really kind of exciting that about taking Cubeto to a next um, level. In terms of awards, we're thinking about the a summit where we get like-minded people for early years together and have a uh, competitions and stuff like that happening in um, into the autumn term. So a lot of positive things are happening and it's just a matter of, you know, taking hold of where we want to go to. And what about if people are listening in and they think, okay, I want to connect. Are you on Twitter or are you on LinkedIn or how can people connect? Better? Yeah, you can t- get us on to Twitter at Primo Toys and the way they would get a hold of us is come to our website, www.primotoys.com. As I mentioned before, one of the things about teacher confidence doing computational thinking is sometimes people don't think they're doing it well or doing it at all. And what I really want to do is spread the message that teachers can get in touch with me. I can go to the school. I can give them a workshop and some lesson plans on how to do computational thinking, things like decomposition, abstraction, debugging, all in a way that they'll understand it and within five minutes be able to go back to their kids and use Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Mark. Thanks for your time. Perfect. Thanks very much. So I'm here. It's Srinivas. Srinivas. Srinivas uh, Mandiam. Yep. I'm rubbish at pronunciation. Uh, who's the CTO and founder of Tinker. Really excited to find out more. But what I'd love to know uh, more so is... How did you get into all of this and what educational problem do you think you're solving? Sure, sure, absolutely. Um, my co-founders and I started Tinker uh, more than four years ago um, in the U.S. And uh, it was basically um, to get our own kids into programming. And, uh, you know, we wanted to uh, see what's out there and um, make something really fun so that they're excited. Uh, and when we couldn't find anything that was uh, you know sort of long lasting and like a proper system we started uh, the company tinker and what started as a sort of a little hobby of our own is now being used by uh, 46 million kids wow. and uh, in more than you know 60,000 schools okay. so, yeah. I, I didn't quite appreciate the scale of this so when you're saying was it 46 million kids yes so how do you measure that? So what's, what's that? Is that in schools or who use the software or what is it? Um, so we um, uh, offer a lot of the stuff that we do for free. Yeah. So kids come into our website, they visit the website and sometimes they just don't do anything and leave or then sometimes they do. So anybody who has tried our uh, software you know, for at least an hour, we count them as a user. Okay. And then what's your particular background? So I, I know you obviously you've mentioned that the impetus with your children to launch the company but we are you from an engineering background previous to that yeah i mean all of us uh, are uh, you know uh, sort of you know geek dads i guess right so uh, that's very trendy right now though yeah so we we all have a background in computer science i have a master's in computer science yeah. and uh, this is not my first startup i mean you know we've done a couple of other startups before the same founding team yeah and uh, the previous one that was called 
uh, to Plasma, and that was something that AT and T acquired. Okay, and uh, you know, we used to be the group uh, working with the Yellow Pages to increase the number of you know mobile and online impressions. Yeah. Uh, and then you know we quit that and started Tinker. So it, in Tinker, it's more of a uh, uh, we have a social cause, right? So that we are yeah. doing, which is getting uh, kids to become makers. Uh, so that's our primary uh, motivation to get kids to start building things, getting their hands dirty, get making stuff rather than just passively. You know, watching uh, Netflix and you know binge watching, and they can do all that. But we want them to be more creative, also. You know, I'm so glad because um, I remember when I went to university, and I guess uh, box sets were becoming a thing, and I'd just see friends just sit there for hours and hours and hours. And I'd go out. Um, I'm making myself sound like I'm like this, but it, it, I just didn't understand it. I'd go out. I'd ride my bicycle. I'd come back, say probably four or five hours later, and they'd be sat in the same position. And uh, I think, you know, this time is so precious. So actually trying right. to question that as a common culture is quite important, I think. Right, right. I mean, so one thing about uh, making stuff is there's a lot of um, sort of uh, intrinsic motivation kids feel. Uh, and, you know, we also have other motivation in the product. We've made it all uh, game-based. Uh, so, you know, if you like dragons, we have something with dragons and you can learn to code with dragons. If you love Minecraft, uh, you know, you can code with Minecraft uh, and Tinker. If you love drones, you can love to code with uh, Tinker and drones. Okay. We like drones because, you know, who doesn't want to fly a drone, right? And so we want to use that passion to, uh, you know, drive more understanding of coding for kids. So uh, let's say as a parent, you buy a drone for a Christmas gift or something, right? Uh, or a birthday gift. Um, you know, they, they use the drone and, you know, maybe they'll put it back and... You know, like, I don't know, like how many times they use it. Yeah. But when you add coding to it, then, you know, it becomes more interesting. You can uh, program the claw to close. You can program the cannon to fire. You can, uh, you know, play with other kids. Uh, it, it becomes much more, you are controlling uh, what your gameplay is. You are defining your own game as a kid. So just from looking very briefly at some of the actual kits, it looks a little bit more affordable than, say, perhaps your off-the-shelf drone. Um, so, can you give us a little bit of insight into, you know, what kind of investment people are thinking about if, if they're um, engaging in some of the hardware that works with the software here as well? Yeah, yeah. So, these drones range from $50 to um, $150, depending on the drone model. I mean, you can go to Amazon or you can go to any website and uh, search for a Parrot Mini Drone and there's all kinds of models. Uh, this latest one is called the Parrot Mambo and uh, this is interesting uh, because it has these attachments. Uh, that you can program, um, and that that also ranges between like hundred to hundred twenty dollars or so. And I'm not sure of the European prices, but it's in the same range. And so, Parrot is a company that you've chosen to specifically work with on this. Yeah, so Parrot is uh, one of the leading manufacturers of uh, drones, uh, and they're a French company, right? So we partner with Parrot uh, for drones. Um, and you know, we partner with uh, other companies too, uh, like you know, with other hardware. Uh, so you're not just sitting in front of the screen and, you know, when there's something tactile that they're holding and they're programming that, it's a different experience than just sort of building a game or something like that. Uh, we have uh, partners like uh, Sphero. Okay, uh, yeah. We work with the uh, Lego Vidu uh, yeah. 2.0. Uh, we support the Philips Hue. Yeah. Um, so, and, and then we support all these padded drones. Uh, but we're always looking for, um, you know, more partners. And once we partner, we also build a curriculum. So, okay. like, what we're working with Parrot is it's not just like, okay, we support the drone, uh, but we actually have a lesson plan. So, teachers actually use that and, uh, you know, that there's a 16-hour course along with uh, each of those products, right? So, we, we, we implement something that's really deep. We map it to standards and we have a teacher guide for teachers, answer keys, puzzles, quizzes. So, when the, te the kids actually use it, I mean, they get a full... Uh, you know, version of like what they can do with the drone. I mean, it's actually a really solid, uh, deep curriculum. And do you have uh, educators on your board? Yeah, we yeah. do have uh, game designers and educators who work with uh, work with us to actually implement the curriculum. So my my other question was going to be, what's the kind of business model around how that? Yeah, works? I mean, so Tinker has uh, you know three streams of revenue. Um, one is. Uh, uh, you know, the one that we're talking about, which is schools, right? So schools yeah. actually have an annual subscription and, uh, you know, they buy our curriculum um, and uh, they get like 
grading and classroom management and all kinds of features that uh, are great for educators, right? And then there's also camps. So camps uh, like Sylvan Learning, ID Tech, all of these sort of large franchises, they use Tinker. So there's a there's a Tinker game design camp or a Tinker Minecraft camp. And then there's the home model where parents will enroll their child in an online course. Okay. And, uh, you know, we have so they pay like a one-off fee and then they do that module of that so course? So we have many uh, different plans okay. for parents, like, you know, it's eight bucks a month or it's 200 bucks lifetime. And so I'm guessing you're based out of the U.S. currently? currently. Yes, we're based out of the U.S. Um, we have about 60,000 schools uh, using Tinker. About 2,000 in the UK. Final question. So I interviewed an investor in EdTech yesterday. And his thoughts on, uh, you know, this kind of trend towards coding is that it's a bit of a red herring in that, you know, are some of those skills going to become automated? So we're teaching them all to, to code in this sort of fashion. But actually, will that become automated itself? Thoughts on that one? Uh, yeah, of course. So one of the things is that somebody is actually building those uh, automatons, right? I mean, yeah. uh, so, so who's writing the code for the self-driving car? <laughs> so, you know, somebody was telling me that, right? Actually. I mean, so uh, somebody was telling me the other day, and uh, I was thinking about it, and I agree that, you know, after about 10 years, uh, either you listen to the computer and do what it tells you, uh, you know, or you be the person telling the computer what to do. Yeah, like, yeah. you know, either you are... Uh, you're, uh, you know, you're, you're listening to your app and doing uh, food delivery or, you know, or becoming an Uber driver, or you be the person who uses Uber, right? So who do you want to be, right? Yeah, yeah. You want ke- uh, people to be in the value chain of creation, uh, that's how they can add value, right? Uh, unless you're making stuff, uh, if you just are a passive user of technology, mm-hmm. you may not... Uh, you may not be. You, you uh, haven't got the skills to play relevant. the chess game, otherwise. Yeah, it's good yeah, to be. Yeah, I mean, it, it's like if you look at all these jobs, right? Um, let's see, um, like travel agent. Mm-hmm. I don't know. That's it's becoming extinct, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, maybe for some high-end vacations because you might call somebody, but every, yeah, yeah, everybody goes to kayak and you know, like Expedia or whatever, hotels.com, and you book your own thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, eBay, no more auctions, right? Yeah. And so like that, you know, like, there's so many things like receptionist, there's a Zoc doc. So all of these things are sort of, if you look at it, some software is doing it. Yeah. So yeah. you want to um, uh, educate kids and sort of help them become makers so that they can actually change the world, right? I mean, they can do something better with software. Yeah. And develop um, as it develops, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, we got, so, we, yeah, I mean, it would be great, like, you know, you can, uh, even programming languages one day will become extinct because all you have to do is tell the computer, right? I mean, the reason we have programming languages and they're all so formal is because computers uh, cannot understand uh, English, which is very ambiguous, you know, and that's not Yeah, I've tried to transcribe some of my podcasts using or- Orphonic before, and it's okay to a certain degree, but you have to go back in there and, you know, jig it. it hasn't quite got the nuance yet. Yeah, I mean, uh, yes, one day you will be able to tell the computer, do it, and then, you know, it's going to do it. But we can't uh, expect that, uh, you know, um, I mean, somebody has to build those things. I think it will be these kids who would build that. Yeah. I mean, it can't be that uh, we think that and uh, it's not me. Somebody's going to do it and, you know. (laughs) And and what do you and your kids love the best from your own tinker range? So is it the drones or is it something else? What's the one that gets you excited where you're like, oh, I really enjoy this myself? Um... So, you know, I'm, like I have a, a 12-year-old daughter. Yeah. I mean, she likes all the, the fun things that we have, like, you know, dragons and, uh, you know, Minecraft. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, drones are... Um, she, she, she likes that, too. And my, my son likes that better. Okay, interesting. Right? Yeah. Uh, in school, there are all these uh, coding clubs. Mm-hmm. And sometimes she comes back and says, oh, there's only boys there, right? Oh, really? And then they don't want to continue. So yeah, that's, yeah, that's yeah, the stigma sense. that, you know, yeah. it's like... And also there's this whole social thing, like, you know, you're like, uh, oh, you know, why don't you do something like needlework or yeah, art, right? Yeah. It doesn't have to be that way, right? I mean, uh, it has, you have to, as a parent, we have to encourage them to get into science and math. Okay, so we do that a lot. And that's one of the, all of these things are sort of personal motivations and also, you know, part of what we hope that we can change with Tinker. Your children are your guinea pigs. It's brilliant. As with every parent, I'm sure. But... Um, and just finally, so I don't know if you've had the chance to pick up either through conversations you've had here or from walking around, uh, what would you consider sort of to be some of the trends in terms of where EdTech is going? Um, 
Yeah, I think the cu curriculum is becoming digital, mm -hmm. and that's one thing that um, uh, is great. And you know, if you look at all the things that have changed in the last, uh, you know. 50 years, I mean, I don't think the classroom has changed that much. Mm -hmm. uh, but with this whole uh, concept of a flipped classroom where, you know, it's where it's blended and, you know, there's like online and offline things. Uh, and the kids are also involved in making, the, making their own uh, plan for what yeah. they want to learn. So all of those kind of things are going to change the way that kids uh, learn. And, you know, it's like some of the things that I see right now is like, you know, I feel like you know when we went to school. I mean, it was really lame. Yeah, yeah. I mean, compared to like, like right now when I see. Although drones, we had BBC logo, I mean that was exciting. Where it's yeah. just yeah, I yeah, guess yeah, it's yeah, the yeah. equivalent know, of, course, of this then, of but yeah. But yeah, um, yeah like the yeah. choices that these kids have right now, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's amazing, right? Yeah, no, it is. It really is. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, and uh, enjoy thank the rest you. of your bet. Thank you. You too. Listening, everyone. If you listened in to episode 62, including ELT Jam previously, you'll be pleased to know that they put out an offer for listeners to get a free UX course by going to eltjam.academy forward slash and using the code edtechpods. Nice one. Don't forget to check out the upcoming extra this week with Oliver Beach. Otherwise, have a great week and see you next time. Bye bye.